All right. My uh, name is Ben Burgess. This is Give Them an Argument. I am joined once again by Ethan from Confronting Capital, Academic Edge Lords, etc. Uh, Victor is on an airplane right now, so uh, depending on the quality of the in-flight Wi-Fi, you know, you might see him pop up in the chat, but not on the screen. But Ethan, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing all right. Uh, at least, at least for now. Prior to hearing uh, Jordan Peterson and Destiny's thoughts on whatever they go into, uh, I'm feeling okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, so I, I actually had to get up at 5 a.m. on the West Coast this morning to do that. Uh, do a radio interview for just like this the Laura Coates show at goes from seven to nine EST. So I, I got one of the last time slots, but it's still pretty brutal. Um, but I am going to try to at least be more coherent than either of the people we're watching. We'll see. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. Given like any analysis and you can't really push anybody from, from one way or another. Uh, in, in terms of like reevaluating any of the beliefs that are part of this constellation, um, I wish I would have. I that's really good. Come, well, yep. That's fine. I wish that's I fine. Yeah, that's sleep right. is the foundation of our mental and nighttime this routine is... to function at your best. If you're struggling with sleep, yeah, that's why we cut off there last time. That the uh, we just got up to the commercial, but here we go. If that's really good. Come, well, yep. That's fine. I wish that's I right. Well, I, yeah. you know, there are models now of sure. there are models now of cognitive processing, belief, belief system processing that make the technical claim that what a belief system does is constrain entropy. Sure, that's not okay. surprising at all. Okay, to me. Yeah. So, and now, now the signal for for released entropy, which would be a consequence of say violated fundamental beliefs, uh -huh. is a radical increase in anxiety. Right, and a decrease in the possibility of positive emotion. And so people will struggle very hard against that, which is exactly the phenomena that you're describing. Yeah. Okay, I agree with what you said. So although, here's, here's my. Yeah, so I'm not sure why it's relevant to what, the, the issue I was I'm getting. I'm getting okay, it. I'm getting fine. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's my issue, okay? So <clears throat> when I'm trying to evaluate a situation, I like to think that I have some, uh, I've got some insulation from the effects of what liberals think or what conservatives think is because on my platform, I don't necessarily have an allegiance to a particular political ideology. Like right now I'm like center left to progressive, but I break really hard from progressive on certain issues. I think Kyle Rittenhouse is in the right. I think basically everything you guys are doing with indigenous people is insane, uh, including the complete mass grave hoax. Uh, I think that uh, I'm a big supporter of the second amendment. Uh, I have beliefs where I can break from my side, you know, pretty hardcore because I am not like a leisure to certain political ideology. One thing that worries me with this constellation of beliefs thing is that sometimes when it comes to evaluating a particular policy or a particular problem, I feel like it's part of the constellation and sometimes it inhibits people from like taking a step back and reasonably thinking about the issue. So when we're talking about climate change, you mentioned the WEF sacrificing tons of people, the UN, global elites, uh, five times energy costs in Germany, uh, genocidal people, I feel like th this is part of like a whole thing where it's like, okay, well, let's take a quick step back and let's just like think rationally about this particular issue for one moment. Okay. Well, you asked me what the motivation for anti-poor policies might be. So that's why I was Well, I did, but, th out. but I got all of those things before I even asked that question. Um, because I think it's totally possible that somebody might say, okay, well, when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it seems to cause an increase in surface temperatures. This has been happening from about the 1800s. And as we started to track surface temperatures, whether the thermometer is on top of the Empire State Building or in the middle of the field, it seems like there's an average rise in temperatures. And people all around the world are observing this in some places more than others. If you live in Seattle and 20 years ago, your apartment building wasn't built with air conditioner units, you feel that now. If you live in a place in London and you've never had an air conditioner before, now that's not acceptable. I think that people on the ground can see that there are changes. And I think that scientists, when they look in labs, can see changes. It might be that some models aren't precise enough. And it might be that that for reasons we don't even understand. Well, the now, economic models maybe, certainly aren't precise enough. Sure, maybe, maybe that Not might be maybe. true. Maybe they can't even use them to predict the price of a single stock for six <laughs> months. 
the economic models are not sufficiently accurate to calculate out the consequences of climate change over a century. Uh, and not in the when, when you, I, I like the comparison because economic models can't predict individual stocks, but they do predict the rough rise of the market. You invest in the S&P yeah, 500, you get about- except for the cataclysmic collapse. Nope, even with the cataclysmic collapse accounted for, you're gonna see about 7% returns on average with inflation okay. over I long periods of time. I wouldn't call an average a very sophisticated model analogous that's to fine, a climate change. That's the difference between climate and weather though, right? Is that climate isn't gonna tell you what the temperature is on a given day, but it might tell you the average surface temperature over a period of one year or 10 years. And then that's the difference between climate and weather. That's the difference well, that's between the like the market and the stock. Difference. It is a hypothetical, but again, we're seeing more and more and more data every okay, single well, year okay, that things so are getting let, hotter let's, and hotter. Let's, so, jump, I mean, it's, let's yeah. jump out of our cloud of presuppositions for a minute. Sure. Now, one of the things that- Oh, no, wait. I, I, oh, wait, yeah, okay. Before we do that, actually, yeah, because okay. I don't want to say, yeah, there, are, there are some things that we've gotten as a result of investing in green energy that have been good. So for instance, uh, the power of solar energy has dropped dramatically in the United States, faster than anybody thought possible, such that, uh, uh, solar energy is like competitive or beating fossil fuels in certain areas. If As long as you can set the solar panels up, you're literally beating yeah, fossil and fuels. and as long energy. as the sun is shining. Well, it's, I mean, it still is, but we're not a nuclear winter no, yet. No, no, so. but it isn't when it's cloudy. And it That's why I said winter. depending on where you live. There are places, right. equatorial places, if you're trying to set up a solar panel in uh, in Seattle, you know, you might not have as much like, or in New York City, or might not have as much. Uh, or in Germany, true. Or um, there are also, Europe, I think or there, in Canada. There are also other issues that are coming up that I think are, obfuscating our ability to evaluate what's being caused by green energy versus not. When we look at energy increases in Germany, um, I think there's a similar constellation around nuclear energy, for instance. People don't want nuclear energy because they think of nukes and they think of nuclear meltdowns and they think of Chernobyl and they think of Fukushima and they think of atomic bombs and that's it. And that's stupid. And I agree with you. But nuclear energy is a totally viable alternative to other forms of Then fossil why fuels. does the radical left oppose it? You think it's just this map? See, you for the, same, for, the just... same, for the same reason the, the right opposes vaccines because it sounds scary and it's a big thing and they don't trust it. Well, the right has a reason to distrust vaccines in the aftermath of the COVID de debacle. <laughs> well, because they were imposed by force. And that was a you, very you, you get to choose idea. if you have a nuclear power plant? That's imposed by force too, no? You don't get to choose where your energy comes from if you live in a country. You just, you turn the light switch and hopefully you don't have a Chernobyl that melts down in your particular town, right? Well, you get to choose it because you can buy it or not. Well, That's I mean, a choice. It does, but it, the Nobody negative, had a choice with the vaccines. Nobody had a choice whether or not they lived near Chernobyl or not. Nobody's a choice. Sure, they There's can, a nuclear they can move away. Well, I don't really well, think it's a to choice. move like 500 miles. That's like telling conservatives when uh, Biden tried to do okay, the OSHA well, mandate for vaccines, look, like, well, you can just get a different job, I'm right? Not, I don't want to debate about whether or not large nuclear power plants are mm -hmm. frightening. They are. Sure. Okay. And there are technologies now where that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and I think I don't, I think that's I do a support the power place place for our discussion right. to go because mm -hmm. I also understand why people are afraid of it. But what I don't understand, for example, is why the Germans shut down their nuclear power plants and the Californians are thinking and have doing the same thing when they have to import power from France anyways. Like it's complete- Or bloody. burn coal, which is a million well, times worse. Not yeah. just coal, mm -hmm. lignite. Yeah. Right, and then with regards to these renewable power sources, they have a very, they have a number of problems. One is they're not, ener they're not energy dense. They require a tremendous infrastructure to produce. They're, they might be renewable, at the energy level, but they're not renewable at the raw materials level. So that's a complete bloody lie. They're insanely variable in their power production. And because of that, you have to have a backup system and the backup system has to be reliable without variability. And that means if you have a renewable grid, you have to have a parallel fossil fuel or coal grid to back it up when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, which is unfortunately very, very frequently. And so again, and so and I'm not going to say there's no place for renewable energy like solar and wind, because maybe there are specific niche locales where those are useful, but the logical, uh, what would you say, antidote to the problem of reliability, if we're concerned about carbon, but we're really not, would be to use nuclear. And the Greens haven't been like flying their bloody flags for 30 years saying, well, we could use fossil fuels for fertilizer and feed people, and we could do, use nuclear power to drive energy costs down in a carbon dioxide free manner. That seems pretty bloody self evident to me. And so then it brings up this other mystery that we were talking about earlier. You know, what's the impetus behind all this? Because the cover story is, oh, we care about carbon dioxide, which I don't think they do, especially given the willingness to sacrifice the poor. It makes no sense to me. 
And I think it's relevant to the issue you brought up, which is that people have these constellations of ideas and there's a driving force in the midst of them, so to speak. They're not necessarily aware of what that driving force is. Don't we? Isn't it more likely that people are either misinformed or misguided than people are legitimately trying to depopulate the planet? I'm look misinformed and ignorant. That's pl that's plenty relevant and worth considering. And stupidity is always a better explanation than malevolence. But malevolence is also an explanation. And no, I don't think it's a better explanation because- Why would we waste so much money sending food aid, having Bush do uh, you know, programs through Africa for AIDS, having other billionaires like Bill Gates invest so much money in anti-malarial stuff? Like, Why would all the global elites be so invested in helping and killing the people here at the same time? Well, some, okay, well some of it's confusion. Okay. You know, and some of it's the fact, you know, many things can be happening simultaneously with a fair bit of internal paradox because people just don't know which way is up often. But the problem with the argument, okay, so so you you tell me what you think about this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Hitler's cover story was that he wanted to make the glorious Third Reich and elevate the Germans to the highest possible status for the longest possible period of time. Okay, but that wasn't the outcome. The outcome was that Hitler shot himself through the head after he married his wife, who died from poison the same day, in a bunker underneath Berlin while Europe was in flames, while he was insisting that the Germans deserved exactly what they got because they weren't the noble people he thought they were. And then you might say, well, Hitler's plans collapsed in flames, and wasn't that a catastrophe? Or you could say, that was exactly what he was aiming for from the beginning, because he was brutally resentful and miserable right from the time he was, you know, a rejected artist at the age of 16. And so he was working or something was working. Uh, you know, I don't usually like to defend Hitler, but uh, I, I do actually think that his intention was to win the war. <laughs> yeah, it seems that way. It's, yeah, it's... One thing that's like a little bit confusing is like Jordan Peterson's positing this depopulation stuff. And uh, Destiny, you know, makes like an argument against it. Like, well, here's some behavior that seems inconsistent with that. Why yeah. does this happen? And then Jordan Peterson seems to respond by just appealing to, you know, like ignorance or incompetence. Like, oh, you know, they just don't know which way is up. So, you know, the contradictory yeah. things happen. But it's like, if you're willing to posit that people are, are ignorant and don't know which way is up, then why also, <laughs> like, you don't need to posit the depopulation stuff to explain what we're talking about in that case. Yeah, right. Like that, that is, that is genuinely wild um, that he's, you know, that he's so like quick to do the backup of, oh, they're just confused and ignorant for anything that doesn't fit. But right. he's also like so confident about this, like Alex Jonesy kind of uh, globalist conspiracy to depopulate the planet that he's also been convinced of. I mean, I think just on a, a more, um, I don't know, like like a less sort of content specific level, uh, one thing that really hits me about this is just how hard a time Peterson seems to be having, like sticking to like one thread at a time and, you know, following, uh, following that thread that, you know, he's like, he was just trying, you know, he, you know, there were like, so he's, arguing that oh you know because models aren't perfect therefore we just have no reason to think that global climate change is the thing we need to worry about and take measures to avoid but then uh he's he's also got to be in his bonnet about the the nuke issue where you know i, I think i think maybe we all said last week we, we actually kind of agree with him but um but that's just a completely separate issue right i mean that's that's just you know i mean whatever and he's attributed it to what he calls the radical left means, I don't know, like libs who annoy him and, and everybody who lumps together with that, which is like, you know, everybody who's to the left of the daily wire. But, um, but he, you know, but he's saying like, okay, I mean, wh what do these th things have to do with each other? It's, it's at the very least not obvious. Um, and, you know, and, and again, the whole, you know, he's saying, I don't think that they really believe that climate change is happening. And part of his evidence for that was the willingness to sacrifice the global poor, which doesn't really make sense 
either because it's 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 like well hold on i mean if you're willing to sacrifice a bunch of people towards some end i mean that's uh that that seems like it's evidence that you do think that the problem you're trying to solve is serious and important and of course you know also you can argue i mean who's actually willing to sac you know like um you know yeah you could say that uh like the radical left wants to address the carbon stuff but while you know, like you mentioned this on the last podcast, they want to address it while helping the poor through like the Green New Deal and stuff. And then you could argue that people in the center who he's lumping in with the radical left really aren't that interested in addressing the climate stuff in a meaningful way. So there's no like big section of the political compass that both is really adamant right. about addressing climate change and wants to step over the poor to do it. Yeah, right. Because it's like, what are the, you know, who are these people who are taking like drastic emergency measures about climate change and also want a smaller welfare state. Like uh, I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't like individuals who like advocate both of those things, but like you said, that there's certainly not a, you know, some obvious portion of like the political spectrum that like really seriously advocates both of those things. I mean, even when you do think about climate measures that you could see is like, you know, that there's like a legitimate critique of as being at the expense of, uh, of, you know, poor and working class people. Uh, it's not like particularly dramatic stuff. I mean, we're talking about like, you know, gas taxes and, you know, things like that. I mean, that, that's not what, you know, nobody who's, you know, nobody who's lying down in the middle of traffic, you know, to, to, you know, to, like raise the alarm bills about climate change thinks, Oh, we need to have like a 2% higher gas tax. Right. King within him and something that might well be regarded as demonic whose end goal was precisely what it attained, which was the devastation of hundreds of millions of people and Europe left in a smoking ruin. And the cover story was the grand third Reich. And so there's no reason at all to assume that we're not in exactly the same situation right now. I think there's a great reason to assume. I think that Hitler's motives and everything that he was trying to do wasn't a secret. I, I, like, I don't think that anybody had to guess that he was incredibly anti-Semitic, that secret, his Aryan supremacy secret, was going to lead to the destruction and the murder of like so many different people in concentration. Like, none of this was a secret. It's not like he was hiding it. Um, he to some extent, I mean, like he, well, he tried to all, maybe hide the death camps, but nobody in Germany was wondering, like, wow, crazy the pogroms are happening as Jewish people. That's so crazy. Or, wow, they're all being shipped to just mainly the Jews to camps to work like that's kind of interesting or wow he talks about this a lot in Mein Kampf but maybe it's just a coincidence uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change the worry that I Why have here not? is because if we're applying people, Why not? Thought, people in Germany thought Hitler was perfectly motivated by the highest of benevolent if I would if I were to take this standard of evidence and apply this lens of analysis, couldn't I say the exact same thing about the conservative constellation of belief? They don't want to intervene anywhere in the world because they don't care about the problems there. Uh, they're anti-immigration because they hate brown people. Trump wanted to ban Muslims from coming to the United States because he's xenophobic. Uh, conservatives uh, don't want to have taxes to help the poor because they want homeless people to starve and, and die in the winter. Uh, but like, I feel like if I some if, of that's true, and yes, you can ad adopt that criticism. Wow. I think the difference with regards especially to the libertarian side of the conservative enterprise, but also to some degree to the conservative enterprises, they're, they're not building a central gigantic organization to put forward this particular utopian claim. And so even if the conservatives are as morally addled as the leftists, and to some degree that might be true, they're not organized with the same gigantism in mind. And so they're not as dangerous at the moment. Now they could well be, and they have been in the past, but at the moment they're not. And so, of course, you can be skeptical about about people's motivations when they're brandishing how, how the moral say, flag. How would we? Why would we say that they're not as concerned about the gigantism? I feel like everybody is when it's a particular well, thing that they care about. You mean if whether they would be inclined in that direction? For sure, that conservatives wield the power of the government whenever they feel they need to, just as liberals do, right? Conservatives were very happy to well, see, that, for instance, abortion okay. was brought back as a look, state that's a, thing. Look, that's a good that's a good objection. I think that. You're correct in your assumption that once people identify a core area of concern, they're going to be motivated to seek power to implement that concern. 
I think cancel culture is a good idea too. I think conservatives uh, prior to the 2000s, if they could censor everything related to either LGBT stuff or weird musical stuff or so that they didn't want their kids to watch, conservatives would do it. But now that you see that like liberals and progressives are kind of wielding that corporate hammer, now conservatives are very much, well, hold on, we need freedom of speech, we need a platform, everybody. And now progressives are like, well, hold on, maybe we shouldn't platform people. I got, I've like, got no disagreement with mm -hmm. those things that you said. And I have no disagreement about your proposition that people will seek power to impose their their central, their central doctrine. Okay, so then you might say, and so we can have a very serious conversation about that, what do we have that ameliorates that tendency? In the or United States, we've got a de uh, hopefully a form of decentralized government. I can't speak to Canada as much, but... Yes, ex well, yeah. yes, that's, that's true. So that's one of the institutional protections against that, because mm -hmm. what that does is put various forms of power striving in conflict with one another, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a very intelligent solution then there are psychological and philosophical solutions as well. And one of them might be that you abjure the use of power, right, as a principle. And so, the, and this is one of the things that was done very badly during the COVID era, let's say, because the rule should be something like, you don't get to impose your solution on people using, using compulsion and force. There's a doctrine there, which is any policy that requires compulsion and force is to be looked upon with extreme skepticism. Now it's tricky. All right. I wasn't going to stop again this soon, but um, two things. One, he keeps saying all this stuff about COVID and I certainly wouldn't deny that there are things that are coercive, right. That were done to get, you know, people to get the COVID vaccines. Like that's certainly true. But from listening to the way he talks about it, you would think that that had gone a lot further than it did, right? Like not just, you know, if you worked for a company with certain kinds of government contracts or whatever, you know, you might have to, uh, you know, or of course your employer could just make you, you know, on their own initiative. But like you would think that there was some sort of th much more sweeping and draconian thing to, to do that was done. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there are a bunch of States where there's like North of 40% of the population that's still unvaccinated now. Right. So, I mean, that just the, the picture he's painting of this sort of like, you know, COVID Stalinism, I think is, is really overstated, but you know, the second thing is, um, you know, it's not, probably going to be news to many people who are watching this, but this whole thing about, you know, coercion is bad. Anything that must be enforced by coercion is bad. You know, it's like, it's, it, it just, it, it's just like really fundamentally unserious. I mean, all distributions of scarce resources are backed up by coercion. Yeah. It's also like, um, it's also strange because he seems to think that, the fact that the uh, COVID vaccines were mandatorily enforced, I mean, they weren't really mandatorily enforced, uh, at least like on the federal level or anything mm -hmm. in the US, maybe it was different in Canada. But, uh, you know, he says like, I mean, like, it, it seems weird to think that because they were mandatorily enforced, that's like a reason to think, you know, that like tells against their efficacy. Like, yeah. it's like not clear why that would be the case. Like, um, you know, like, uh, I guess maybe the idea is, oh, well, if they were, uh, if they worked well, uh, people would get them voluntarily and they wouldn't need to be uh, enforced. But like, you know, I mean, I think that just like assumes a more, you know, a, right. a conception of the average person as basing their decisions on the state of the research more than people actually do. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of things that are good for your health to do that many people don't do and that are bad for your health to do that many people do do. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's so, I mean, I guess I could see that argument, but I could also think like, look, uh, to the extent that people are willing to do things that are to one extent or another coercive to get people to take the vaccine. And again, it's really worth emphasizing, you know, the FBI was not going door to door, you know, giving people shots right? Like handcuffing them if they tried to resist. Uh, there were some jobs where you had to take the shot as a condition of, you know, getting the job. And that's about it, right? Like for the most part, like outside of, you know, some very blue areas where, you know, they're, 
Um, there were mandates for proof of vaccination for, for indoor dining. Uh, I remember that, but like, you know, certainly depending on what part of the country you lived in, there were many, many, many people for whom there was not the slightest coercion to, to get it. But even if, um, and again, very large percentage of Americans still don't, right. You know, but, um, but, you know, again, I wouldn't deny that some of what was done was to one extent or another coercive. And, you know, obviously you can argue about the ethics of that, but also, you know, given the dangers of transmission and all that stuff, but, uh, which is, but I would also think, look, the, if people are willing to use coercion and get people to get it, that could also be taken as evidence that they're pretty sure it works, right? That they're willing to do something that they know is courting backlash to do it. Well, what are they getting out of it, right? Like, it, it seems like if they're not getting, you know, um, dramatically lower rates of COVID out of it, uh, and, you know, and, and everything that, you know, everything that would be desirable that comes from that, what are they getting out of it? I mean, does Jordan Peterson believe in the, you know, Soros microchips, you know, and the vaccines, like, yeah. uh, you know, you, you do need an alternative explanation there. So, and, and it is, and I'm glad you pointed that out because I thought about it when I was watching, I forgot about it, that, uh, this is actually one of the things that made me really think it's like, man, he's bad at staying, sticking with the thread and following it, that, um, there's a thing where he was like, oh, well, they're like, why is the bloody radical left, you know, hate nuclear power? And, you know, destiny, credit where credit's due, had, you know, so it was like, well, you know, you could ask, you know, because it's, it's, you know, it's big and it's new, or whatever. It's like he says, you know, it might be some of the same psychological reasons why the, the right, you know, has all these anti-vaccine sentiments now. And he said, well, they have a reason to not trust it given the coercion, but it's like, well, that, I mean, I could understand having like a libertarian moral objection to the coercion, but that has nothing to do with whether the vaccines work or not, right? That's a completely separate subject unless the idea is, oh, if they worked, everybody would just be rushing to, you know, to get them. Yeah, unreasonably optimistic picture of the average, the average citizen. Yeah, and even if it's like, you know, I mean, you don't need that many people not to be vaccinated for it to be a big problem, right? Like it can, right. I mean, majority of people could rush out and get it and it could still be, it could still be like a health concern if there's like 35% of people who don't, right? right. Like, you know, so, um, so yeah, that, that just, uh, yeah, none of that really, you know, none of that really makes any sense. Um, I mean, I will say going back to the climate change stuff again, I do, I do find destiny centrism a little bit frustrating here because, you know, I would really like to see him pushing the argument here that, um, in fact, the global poor are the people who are suffering most terribly as a result of climate change. And also there are ways of addressing climate change that don't require us to pick between, you know, these, these, these goods. And in fact, that's what, anybody you could remotely call the, the radical left. I mean, the social democratic left, right? You know, they, you're, you know, AOCs and Bernie's and all those people, that's certainly what they advocate. So, um, you know, it's, it's just for the sake of equal time. Cause you know, cause, cause Peterson's been so insane in this section that, you know, he's, he's hogging most of the criticism here. <laughs> it is probably worth mentioning that also. Because now and then you have to deal with psychopaths and they tend not to respond to anything but force. And so there's an exception there that always has to be made, and it's a very tricky exception. But look, let, let, me, let me tell you a story, and you tell me what you think about this, because I think it's, it's very relevant to the concern that you just, you just expressed. And I, I don't believe that the conservatives are necessarily any less tempted by the, by the calling of power than the leftists. That's going to vary from situation to situation. Though I would say probably overall in the 20th century, the leftists have the worst record in terms of sheer numbers of people killed. So I, I mean, it depends on how we're quantifying Not that. really. Find, okay, yeah, we'll I just mean, quantify sure. Mao. How's that? Direct death of 100 million people. So, you know, that's a pretty stark fact. And if we're gonna argue about that, well, then we're really not gonna get anywhere. 
So and I, I'm can, not disagreeing that there, the Holodomor happened as well. The Soviet Union and the and yes. China were horrible. I mean, I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to. Yeah, okay. Those were horrible well, things. Yeah, of course. And yeah. It's a war of. You know, I'm just saying, it, for World War II, it depends on how much you attribute the war does to Nazi Germany, et cetera, et cetera. But but sure, like largely speaking, I, I don't think that the left beat the right uh, because the right wasn't trying. I don't think it's because Hitler's lack of trying led him to kill us people then what who ended up dying during the Great Leap Forward or during the industrialization of the Yes, well, I also think it's an open question still to what degree Hitler's policies were right wing versus left wing. And no one's done the analysis properly yet to determine that. Well, what do we because consider? Because it was a national socialist movement for a reason. And the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. Well, but the so I mean, there was awesome. no, uh, you know, cooperatively formed businesses that were owned by all of the people for the people and distributed to the people. And I don't think redistribution was high on Hitler's list of That's things true. to do for That's it. true. Yeah. It was but a I strange mix that, of, sure. of well, totalitarian but I also, policy. I don't think it was a strange mix. I think it was a bid to appeal to uh, mid-left and center-left, the KPD and the German Socialist Party by calling themselves National Socialists. I think it was very much like an authoritarian, ultra-nationalist regime that pretty squarely fits with. I, people get mad if you call something far right or far left because they have a, an well, you know, terms, one but... of the things I would have done if I would have been able to hang on to my professorship at the University of Toronto would have been to ex extract out a random sample of Nazi policies and strip them of, of markers of their origin and present them to a set of people with conservative or, or leftist beliefs and see who agreed with them more. And that analysis has never been done as far as I know. So we actually don't know. And we could know if the social scientists would do their bloody job, which they don't, generally speaking. That's something we could know. We could probably use the AI systems we have now, the large language models, to determine to what degree left and right beliefs intermingled in the rise of national socialism. So that. Okay, I promise we're going to start doing the ten minute segments, but I, I just really because yeah, this this clip was going around on on uh, Twitter. So I, I have seen this before, and, and I, I really just got to pause to say this is just an astonishingly stupid proposed method of figuring out where somebody's politics lie. I mean, there, there are just so many layers of weirdness here that you're going to strip down obvious markers and then present just random people with like a random sample of like things that the Nazis had did and then use their judgments to determine whether, you know, whether those things are left or right. And then, you know, if there are like three of them are left and, you know, two are right or whatever, then you conclude the Nazis were actually leftists. Yeah. Yeah. It's very bizarre. I mean, among other reasons, like, you know, like it seems like in terms of judging how left or right the Nazis were overall, like some policies are going to be more relevant than other policies, you know, like, you know, I, I mean, policies are going to be to some degree like weighted based on their salience in terms of how much they count as, you know, in terms of representing the overall political ideology. And so just like taking like a random sample of, of policies is weird for that reason, uh, among other reasons, you know. Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, this is like, I mean, a much more benign example, but, um, you know, this is like I talked about in my first book when uh, Nate Silver during the 2016 uh, primaries, um, my, uh, who, uh, yes, is the person I actually once slightly knew I've talked the most smack about and uh, uh, she was in, uh, uh, went to East Lansing High School with me back when, but, uh in um in any case uh my uh, my uh uh classmate and uh and and uh elhs uh, debate team my <laughs> member uh nate uh broke wrong in a politically uh and uh and he was very very fond of trotting out in like 538 analyses during the democratic primaries in, in uh, 2016 he was very fond of trotting out this data point uh, that, um, the, uh, that, you know, when Bernie and Hillary were both in the set, you know, people say that there's this big political difference between them, but when Bernie and Hillary were both in the Senate, you know, they voted the same way, whatever it was, 87% of the time or something. And it's like, it, it just always drove me crazy when he'd say this because like, well, okay. I mean, even beyond the fact that they were only in the Senate together for like two years and uh, Hillary was actually running for president during that time. So she missed tons of votes and 
presidential candidates usually come back for the votes that are most important for their base, which is why like every single democratic candidate ever who's like running from the Senate, there's always this right wing talking point that analysis, their voting record shows that they're the most liberal member of the Senate. Cause it's like, yeah, they just came back for the votes that the base cares about. Right. <laughs> but, um, but even if you put all that aside, it's like, it's just to completely insane to think that you could that like the quantitative measure is going to be reasonable there. Cause it's like, well, okay, you have all kinds of like procedural votes and, you know, votes on like budget things where every Democrat is going to be voting one way and every Republican is voting another way. But it's like, I mean, so you're counting all those, those votes the same way as like voting for the Iraq war or, you know, voting for the Patriot act or, you know, uh, proposing you know medicare for all the senate versus being openly against that you know like it just you know it's just crazy on that level and it's like yeah sure i mean i'm sure that like if you just take a bunch of random things that the nazis did right it's like well you just find a lot of things that governments of all kinds left right or center were doing right that like oh they you know uh had to pay for the war so they they had to raise taxes you know they uh or, you know, they're, they're just doing like sort of basic, like providing like basic social services that again, even like center right governments were also providing. And it's like, yeah, if you just take those out of context, like, well, those aren't really the things, you know, it's like, look, this is, these aren't really the things that were most distinctive about the Nazis, right? <laughs> like, uh, right. The things that were distinctive about the Nazis weren't that they did you know, some social welfare that some taxes, you know, like they right. built some roads, you know, whatever. It's like, it's, it, it was really more the, uh, you know, trying to wipe out the inferior races, you know, like all that, that's really more what they're, they're remembered for and were primarily distinguished for at the, uh, at the time. Right. So, so that's just completely insane. And also the idea that like, I mean, I don't I want to sound like an academic elitist here, but it's like the idea that's like you're just gonna like ask a bunch of random people, and it's like that that like whatever their judgment is about this, it's like that's what you're going with. Why, right? Why right. are they authoritative about this? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah, and then it's like yeah, like I, I mean, what what you mentioned, like. um you know, you, it could just be like most of the policies are uncontroversial or yeah. there might, be, you know, you take like five policies, most of them are uncontroversial, but then like one policy is like, you know, it's sort of a slightly like barely left wing policy. And then you have your one left wing policy and then you have a right wing policy, which is like far, far right, you know, like exterminate the Jews. And so it's like, oh, well, we asked uh, a bunch of lefties and a bunch of righties, they each roughly supported four out of these five proposals. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. Yeah. It's, it's just so, um, yeah, it just, it, like, there's just no level at which this makes sense as a procedure for judging, like whether anything that any, but like whether any government, right. Is, is like left wing or right wing that, you know, that you're, you're going to, you're going to take, policies selected at random that may or may not be significant or distinctive strip them of like things that would make it too easy. And then you're going to ask a bunch of random people with no special expertise who haven't spent any particular amount of time thinking about this, yeah. what they, their judgment would be. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure you could be like, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, he, uh, he did, uh, he did an amnesty for undocumented immigrants. Uh, he, uh, he withdrew from from Libya, you know, after the the attack on the Marine barracks. Um, he uh, he did, a, you know, he did a compromise on Social Security that was like much less than you know uh, what a lot of you know what a lot of right wing Republicans would have wanted. I, like, I'm sure you could come up with some stuff, right? Like to to like paint to paint Reagan as a as a leftist, or you know that, uh, or you know you could. Um, you know, or, you know, whatever, I mean, pick, you know, you know, pick the right policies in the right way. Right. You know, and it's, and, you know, and, and like Lenin comes out as a conservative, it's like, this is, uh, you know, it's just not like, it's just not a serious way of thinking about this stuff. Like, like, as opposed to like, okay, what are the core issues 
that they're fighting with other political factions about and yeah. that, you know they would do that nobody else would do and uh yeah this this is just like and he's just so he's just so confident about it like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. They would just the do their it's bloody like, job <laughs> yeah. yeah well it's also like you know, even if he'd presented an analysis, which, you know, was non silly, where it's like, okay, yeah, that would be, you know, that seems like a valid way to go about sure. it. Like, it's it's strange to pretend that like, oh, in the absence of having done that, we yes. have nothing on which to base like a reasonable probability estimate. It's like, you know, and, and also like, you know, he mentions this method of just, oh, you know, if you want to do this methodology of taking people of different political ideologies and seeing how much they agree with the Nazis, well, we can almost do that. We can see, okay, let's look at the people who approve of the Nazis by and large and approve of the Nazis' <laughs> legacy and see whether they describe themselves as left wing or right wing. And I, you know, I think the answer would be pretty clear. Yeah. It's also, yeah, like this, I mean, to your point that uh, about how insane it is to act like, well, even if you had come up with like a really good objective test. Like you were laying out a really good objective test and not one that, you know, is like incoherent and bizarre, like um, saying, Oh, well, nobody has done that. So we're just in the dark. It's like, I don't know. Has anybody done the equivalent for Mao? Right. Like you're just, right. you, yeah. you know, you're asserting that Mao is very left wing because it's obvious and everybody knows it, but it's like, okay, if we're allowed to appeal to it's obvious and everybody knows it, I'm pretty sure what that, what verdict that's going to give us about the Nazis. Right. Right. Yeah. That's an interesting question. I would, I'd be interested to, to hear him ask to justify his, his view on, you know, Stalin and, and Mao being examples of the failures of leftism in the absence of this kind of analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have a, all right. Yep. Let's keep going. That's all technically possible. So, and it hasn't been done. So it's a matter of opinion. Sure. So, I, but, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, that, that, that's something you could do. Okay. I, yeah, so but, I was going to tell yeah, you the story. Yeah, sorry, okay. Well, this mm -hmm. has to do with the use of power. So, um, I spent a time, at, uh, with a group of scholars putting and analyzing the Exodus story and Exodus seminar recently. And so the Exodus story is a very interesting story because it's a, it's a, what would you say? It's an analysis of the central, the central tendency of movement away from tyranny and slavery. That's a good way of thinking about it. So the possibility of tyranny and the possibility of slavery are possibilities that present themselves to everyone within the confines of their life, psychologically and socially. You can be your own tyrant with regards to the imposition of a set of radical doctrines that you have to abide by and punish yourself brutally whenever you deviate from them. And we all contend with the issue of tyranny and slavery. And there's an alternative path, and that's what the Exodus story lays out. And Moses is the exemplar of that alternative path, although he has his flaws. And one of his flaws is that he turns too often to the use of force. So he kills an Egyptian, for example, an Egyptian noble who has slayed a Hebrew, uh, one of the, uh, Moses' Hebrew slave brothers, and he has to leave. There's a variety of indications in the text that he uses his staff, he uses his rod, and he uses power when he's supposed to use persuasion and legal or verbal um, invitation and argumentation. And this happens most particularly, most spectacularly, right at the end of the sojourn. So Moses has spent 40 years leading the Israelites through the desert, and he's right on the border of the promised land. And really what that means at a more fundamental basis is that he's at the threshold of attaining what he's been aiming at, what he's devoted his whole life to. And he's been a servant of that purpose in the highest order, and that Israelites are still in the desert, which means they're lost and confused. They don't know which way is up. They're still slaves, and now they're, they're dying of thirst, which is what you die of, spiritual thirst, if you're sufficiently lost. And they go to Moses and ask him to intercede with God, and God tells Moses to speak to the rocks so that they'll reveal the water within. And Moses strikes the rocks with his rod twice instead, right? He uses force. And so God says to him, 
you'll now die before you enter the promised land. It's Joshua who enters and not Moses. Okay, and you're, you might wonder why I'm telling you that story. I'm telling you that story because those concepts at the center of that cloud of concepts that you described are stories, right? They're stories. And if they're well formulated, they're archetypal stories. And this is an archetypal story that's illustrating the danger of the use of compulsion and force. You know, and so one of the problems you're obviously obsessed by and that I'm trying to solve is what do we do as an alternative to tyranny, whether it's for a utopian purpose in the future or maybe for the purpose of like conservative censoring music lyrics they don't approve of. And one answer is we don't use force. We do the sort of thing that you and I are trying to do right now, which is to have a conversation that's aimed at clarifying things. And so that's a principle that that's something like the consent of the governed, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's something like, but it's also something like you have the right to go to hell in a handbasket if that's what you choose. And I'm, as long as you don't, you know, in doing so, you're not in everyone's way too much. You have the right to your own destiny, right? And so, and you, and you don't get to use power to impose that. That's the other thing that worries me about what's going on on the utopian front. Because the, the problem is, you know, once you conjure up a climate apocalypse and you make the case that there's an impending disaster that's delayed, and you might say, well, delayed how long? And the response would be, well, we're not sure, but it's likely to occur in the next hundred or so years, which is pretty inaccurate. You now have a universal get out of jail card that can be utilized extremely well by power mad psychopaths. And they will absolutely do that because power mad psychopaths use whatever they can mm -hmm. to further their cause. So here's my, this is my issue, I think. This is my issue with a lot of people when it comes to political conversations. I think that everything you've said is true. And I think that all of it is, it's it's good analysis, but I feel like it just gets wielded sometimes in one direction. And then people kind of miss that it completely and fully describes their entire side as well. Um, and, and the thing that I feel like the only solution for this is you hinted at it. Um, it's more than just conversation, although that's a good start. We have to go back to inhabiting similar areas. We have to go back to inhabiting similar like media landscapes. I think that the issue that we're running into right now more than anything else is people live in completely separate realities at the moment, such that uh, if we were even to describe basic reality, how many illegal immigrants came into the United States last year? That should be a factual number that we can know. How many um, do you think? Somebody, um, <clears throat> I, the actual number, probably in the hundreds of thousands. I think some conservatives think it's 3 million per year over the past three years because they look at like border contacts or they look at asylum seekers and they're not looking yeah, at- Yeah, I think it's 3.6 million. Came into the US and stayed? Yes, through the okay. southern border. Okay, so- You know the historical- Wait, 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 you know okay, the wait, 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 I got it. I got, I got, I got, I got I understand, I understand this chart. Well, but history, historically, there's like 13 to 15 million people full stop in the United States illegally. That's like the all history of illegal immigration in the United States. But some- uh, but hey, maybe I'm wrong there, right? So we can say that, that that's an example of us living in a fundamentally different reality. Um, well, the Pew Research Group has established quite conclusively that the variability over the last 20 years for illegal migration in the South border is between 300,000 and 1.2 million. Well, the Pew Research can only establish, I think, the number of people attempting to cross. I don't know if they can know. I don't know if Pew does like census analysis. I'd have to see. Well, the, I don't. The well, here. that's. That's a but, different issue, right? Sure. Because I don't know how you measure how many illegal immigrants there are actually in the country. I understand. I just want to point illegal. out, I just want to point out, I agree with you. I listened to a lot of Rush Limbaugh growing up. I understand the fear of having a government agency say climate change. Therefore, we have a blank check to do whatever we want. That's yes, a scary. Which is what they are doing. The conservatives do the same thing, though. I'm, I'm not they claiming didn't... otherwise. Yeah, but the problem is I think people don't talk about it. So, for instance, I heard, so we can pretend now that the conservative argument was just compulsory vaccines are bad because they infringe on my freedom. That wasn't the conservative argument. The conservative argument was that mass deaths were gonna happen, mass side effects were gonna happen. Uh, there was gonna be all this corruption and stuff related to vaccine distribution, to the crazier theories were microchips and blah, blah, blah. None of that came true. Absolutely none of the conservative fear mongering related to the mRNA vaccines came to fruition, but now that's all forgotten. And that was- What do you mean none of it? What do you make of the exit? Imagine being able to transition academic papers, textbooks, websites, emails, or um, it is a good reminder while we're uh, while we're paused for the commercial uh, that I was thinking about this 
when they were talking about use of power and coercion earlier um, that, you know, Peterson said, well, you know, leftists are, you know, are the ones who want to use this sort of, you know, gigantic or, you know, gigantism suffering uh, state to enforce their will in a way that the right really doesn't. And, and one of the things that occurred to me as he was saying that is like, well, hold on, like one of the biggest right wing causes right now uh, is, uh, is cracking down harder on immigration uh, that this is, I mean, when the Republican primary was still going on, there was an analysis that the word border had appeared more often in political ads so far that year, this year than any other word, including standard words like endorse and message. Uh, and, you know, this is, I mean, that's, this is actually really like the most draconian part of the American state, you know, is, is the, uh, the immigration enforcement apparatus that you have a federal level, multiple federal level agencies that are in that engage in systematically trying to track down, uh, and round up and throw in cages or deport, um, you know, nonviolent people, you know, for, for, you know, for, for being in a place without government, uh, permission and, you know, whatever you think about that normatively, it's certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly like one of the most, you know, you want to talk about gigantism, you know, in, in, uh, in coercive power. I mean, it's, it's one of the most extreme examples and it's, it's just been escalating under president and president, you know, presidents of both parties, you know, for, uh, for the last couple of decades. Um, and there was just a whole thing where, uh, there was this bipartisan, you know, border bill, uh, that would have taken away a lot of due process rights for asylum seekers in order to, um, in order to process people and deport them from the country more quickly. Uh, and the only reason it didn't pass was that, um, you know, Trump told Republicans to vote against it, uh, in part, you know, to, I'm sh- surely in, in part because the, um, you know, to make sure that they'd have the issue for the election, but also like the official objection was that the reason they were voting against it was because it didn't go far enough, you know, that it, it wasn't draconian enough. Right. So it's, it's just, you know, this is the thing that even like, uh, Daniel Bessner, who's been like very critical of, of the use of fascism analogies, will say it's like, yeah, ICE is like the most actually fascist like part of the, uh, the American state. Um, but you know, I, I think that's the kind of thing that, I mean, even though Peterson is clearly on top of the immigration fear mongering discourse, you know, he's got, you know, he's got all of his numbers ready to hand about Pew and all that stuff. Um, which by the way, uh, I don't know about the specific Pew thing, but the numbers I often see people floating around, uh, they count numbers of encounters, which is actually the Border Patrol's term for arrests, right? So they're 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 taking more people being arrested while trying to come into the United States uh, as as evidence of a wide open border. But, uh, but, but again, it's just, you know, along with, you know, I think, I think Destiny's example is also good about abortion. Um, but you know, just, just the idea that the right is, is generally less interested, you know, which I guess to be fair, Peterson has been backing off of a little bit more every time the subject comes up, but the idea that the right is generally less interested in, in using coercion, um, is just wild, even aside from like the basic G.A. Cohen, Matt Brunig kind of point that, um, you know, property rights are coercion. I mean, every, you know, any, any time, you know, like any time you have scarce resources, not everybody can use them all at the same time to the same degree, then you, uh, then whatever scheme you come up with, um, you know, it's, is it's all coercion. Uh, so even putting that aside, which would be the point that would actually be more important to me, but, you know, just put it aside and focusing on the stuff that people will sort of typically be more willing to count as coercion. Um, even in those terms, it, you know, I I mean, it, it really, I think Peterson's just showing all kinds of cognitive distance here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's also worth wondering, like on that point, like, I wonder if like Jordan Peterson would say, 
that like borders are a bad idea because governments like use coercion to enforce them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Something tells me that would be, that would be like, Oh no, but that's actually okay. Right. This is a, <laughs> this is a legitimate case of coercion. Right. Um, yeah. What do you mean? None of, to, what do you make of the excess deaths? There, that for related to vaccines, there are almost none. This, the mRNA vaccines have been administered excess, to excess for deaths related to vaccines. Absolutely. We don't know. No, no, we absolutely we don't know. know. We absolutely. Wait, this is that? like what settled science. Know? What do we know for, in terms of vaccine related? No, 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 no. That's not my question. Excess deaths in Europe are up about twenty percent, and they have been since the end of the COVID par- par- Sounds pandemic. Sounds really high to me. Twenty. Go look. Uh, Go we, look. I'll check afterwards. But um, is this including like the Ukrainian war with Russia? No, no, it's not including the Ukrainian war. Okay. No. What no, are, no. are you implying that you think it's because of vaccines? I'm or? not implying anything. I'm well, saying you're, you're, what the e- excess deaths are. But what's, now, what's your take on what's causing that? It? Well, you said that, in, and you said that in a counter to me describing mRNA vaccines. You said, "Well, the excess deaths are twenty percent." That makes it the implication is that the vaccines are causing well, it. Or some, okay, it? first of all, something is causing it. Well, at that obviously, okay. yeah. something is causing <laughs> sure, it, or, or some combination of factors. Sure. Now, one possibility is that the healthcare systems were so disrupted by our insane focus on the COVID epidemic that we're still mopping up as a consequence of that. Wait, are these excess? That's tracing back through COVID as well? Post-COVID. Just post-COVID. Post-COVID. Okay. Okay. Right. They're terrifying. Right. They're terrifying. And and they're not well publicized. And I think excess trust, the fact that you're speaking to them right now seems like... Yeah, but I ferret down a lot of rabbit holes. It's not like it's front bloody page news on the New York Times. Sure, but I think excess deaths is a, that's a metric that you can Google, and I'm pretty sure there are like three different huge organizations that track excess deaths around the world. And there are many countries. more than three, yes, sure. in every single European country. Right. Okay, well, so one relatively straightforward hypothesis is, is that it's a consequence of the disruption of the healthcare system, the staving off of cancer treatment, et cetera, the increase in depression, anxiety, suicidality, and alcoholism that was a consequence of the lockdowns, the economic disruption. And there's plenty of reason to believe that some of that is the case. But the other obviously glaring possibility is that injecting billions of people with a vaccine that was not tested by any stretch of the imagination with the thoroughness that it should have before it was forced upon people also might be a contributing factor. Partly we because we know that it led to a rise in myocarditis among young men. And we also know that there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to ever recommend that that vaccine was delivered to young children. So whose there, risk of death at COVID was so close to zero that it might as well have been not, zero. When you're talking about a disease, the risk of death isn't the only thing that you worry about for the disease. Also so you're going to talk about transmission? We're, we're, because we're, we're that was another about, thing that the we can talk COVID about vaccine transmission. pushed. Yeah, we but can, it didn't do anything we to transmission. Talk, it absolutely did because it decreased your chance of getting infected. It didn't destroy. It didn't get rid of transmission, but it reduced transmission. Yeah, but it was your claimed that it would get rid of only transmission. Only if you take one reading of one single quote, I think that oh, Biden said one time where he said, no, come on, I've heard so many times they say, oh, you can't take anything Trump says seriously. Biden one Jesus time on the news Christ. says, if you get the vaccine, you won't that transfer the so disease. That is so silly. Which was a, no. Do you know that our prime minister in Canada deprived Canadians of the right to travel for six months because the unvaccinated were going to transmit COVID with more likelihood than the, than the vaccinated? So this wasn't one bloody statement. This I, was no, like no, hold on. thorough I, what government I, what policy I, What I'm saying country. is there wasn't a statement given that if you get vaccinated, there is a 0% chance of transmitting the disease. The idea is that vaccines were supposed to help because Fine. it well, reduces, it reduces we, your hospitalization, yeah. reduces death, and it reduces transmission, hopefully by making it so that people don't get sick or don't get sick for as long. All three of those things, the vaccines did exceedingly well. They continue to do that to this day, but especially for the first variant um, and then the Delta variant, the vaccines helped immensely here. Um, they were well, tested. The myocarditis rates are like seven out of 100,000 injections. And the myocarditis is generally acute. And it's generally not as bad as even getting the coronavirus itself, which will lead you also to having myocarditis. It's a much worse side effect than side effects that have caused other vaccines to be taken off the market before. 
That so, a but seven it, out of one hundred thousand rate of acute myocarditis or pericarditis is not a worse uh, side effect than any other vaccine. I think that is a completely acceptable, given that the disease itself is more likely to cause myocarditis or pericarditis. Yes, I don't totally think the data suggests to support that presupposition anymore. The latest peer-reviewed studies show that that's simply not true, especially among young men. The, the, so there is an age bracket of young men where the elevated rate of myocarditis, acute myocarditis from the vaccine, might have been higher. But we're talking about like three or four cases per 100,000 people. And again, myocarditis, pericarditis are generally acute conditions. Well, they I don't told last you at for the very beginning, long. I told you at the beginning of this conversation that the progressive leftists were on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's not about being on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's about- Really? One, really, yeah. It's yeah, what I like, see, so what I see, uh, what I see as the unholy part of that alliance with the pharmaceutical companies is that it dovetails with the radical utopians' willingness to use power to impose their utopian vision. Well, then what do you because make otherwise, of the fact how that... would you explain it? Because the leftists should have been the ones that were most skeptical about the bloody pharmaceutical companies. And they jumped on the vaccine bandwagon in exactly the same way that you're doing right pharmaceutical now. Pharmaceutical companies have helped us tremendously. Yeah, throughout right. The... There we go. Fine. No, do you think modern I don't medicine think hasn't? so. No, I don't think that so. You're just wrong. I think they're you're utterly wrong. I see. So you don't think that the pharmaceutical companies who dominate the advertising landscape with 75% of the funding are corrupt. I don't, corrupt is a corrupt. very broad- No, 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 no it's do you, think that, do you think that- Corrupt do you think with they, a tinge of malevolence, do you think willing that, to extract money out of people by putting their health on the line. Do you, you don't think believe that, we, that? Do you think that we get effective drugs from pharmaceutical companies? Not particularly. Okay. Do you, so do you think that any vaccines work? Yes. Do you think that any- I don't think 80 of them work at once for babies. I, I think that's a little risky. But, but yet we've been on this vaccine schedule for how many decades? Like and this, don't... like this, not like this, not carefully. I had a ton of vaccines when I was a child. I'm pretty sure that was the norm for people. There were a ton of vaccines. There's to way to. more now. Okay. And you think well, that- Well, you can understand why. I mean, look, part of it, no doubt, no doubt part of it is a consequence of the genuine genuine willingness to protect children. But the moral hazard is quite clear. And people on the left used to be aware of this. What do you, you make of the fact, can, what do you think the mRNA vaccine, the speeding up of it came from? How do you make for the fact that it was Donald Trump that did terror, work speed? Terror, so you, foolish panicking, just like we're doing with the climate issue. So you think foolish Trump was, panicking. was he in bed with the pharmaceuticals? Was he working with the left or was it just a dumb, that was the only panicky thing he made. He didn't try to push for the mass lockdowns like other far left people would have wanted him to do. That was just the one mistake he made was the pushing for the vaccine. No, I think Trump undoubtedly made all sorts of mistakes and lots. And it wasn't, it certainly wasn't only the left that stampeded toward the forced COVID, COVID vaccine um, um, debacle. But it was most surprising to me that it emerged on the left, because the left at least had been protected against the depredations of gigantic predatory corporations by their skepticism of, 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 of the gigantic enterprises that can engage in regulatory capture. And that just vanished. Is it not possible that maybe people looked and they said, hey, if all the governments, all the institutions, all the schools, all the private companies across all the countries around the world are saying the same thing. Yeah. Maybe it is the case that this vaccine just helps. Is that not possible? Oh, sure. They probably, that's sure. Of course it's possible, but that didn't mean it was right. Well, who's they this, used force. Well, if, if, who, they used force. We use force for all sorts of things in terms of public health. We don't health. generally use force to invade people's bodies. How long have vaccine mandates been a thing in Canada, the United States, and the entire world? I don't think they should have been a thing. That's great I if you don't think they should have been, but when you say we don't Geneva generally policy. use force, we absolutely use force. We use, look, or we, okay, we've enforced look, vaccines for a long time. Okay. It's an important part of public yes, health. fair enough. We did it on a scale and at a rate during the COVID pandemic, so-called pandemic, that was unparalleled. And the consequence of that was that we injected billions of people with an experimental, and it wasn't a bloody vaccine. Of Just, course. No, it wasn't. Yes, it, it was. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's not. Well, isn't it a 100% success rate? You think it's a definition of vaccine? The whole point of the vaccine is to give your body a protein it's to train on so the immune system works. Who cares if it's not the same? There's plenty of, there's they different types They used the word of, vaccine so that they didn't have to contend with the fact that it wasn't the same technology. There are different types of vaccines there certainly that are, are, that are different technologies. Fine. The mRNA vaccine is a type this of used vaccine to be technology. Vaccines. Now this is vaccine. No, it was like this and now it's like this. No, no, no. It was like this and now it's like this. The MNR, mRNA technology 
was a radical qualitative leap forward in technology. You can call it a vaccine if you want to, but it bears very little resemblance to any vaccine that went before that. And the reason it was called a vaccine was because vaccine was a brand name that had a track record of safety and shoehorning it in that was one of the ways to make sure that people weren't terrified of the technology. And I you think know, the reason it's called a vaccine is because they're injecting you with something that's inoculating you against something in the future because it has proteins that resemble a virus that infects your There are overlaps between, between, between the mRNA technologies and vaccines, to be sure. But they wouldn't have been put forward with the rate that they were put forward if they weren't a radical new technology. And it's bad in principle to inject billions of people with an untested new technology. Isn't it also bad in principle for billions of people to get infected with a worldwide pandemic that initially was causing a decent number of deaths, a ton of complications, shutting down world economies? Maybe, maybe it was, maybe it was. So shouldn't we be able to engage like, in that analysis and figure out like if we look at- the We're not engaging the vaccine, in the analysis. No, because now we're, we're talking about whether or not vaccines happened. or even vaccines or not instead. No, 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 we're, no, no, don't play that game. That is not what I was doing. I was making a very specific and careful case. The mRNA technology by wide recognition is an extraordinarily novel technology. And that doesn't make it, it not a vaccine though. Well, okay. It's a radically transformed form of vaccine. I don't we give a damn. Updates. That still makes it something so new that the potential danger of its mass administration was highly probably, highly probable to be at least or more dangerous than the thing that it was supposed to um, protect against. And we are seeing that in the excess deaths. We are deaths. absolutely not saying. So are you implying yeah, now that the right. excess were caused by the vaccines or? I don't, it like I don't bloody well know what they're that's caused what you're implying by. now. All right. Uh, <laughs> so we're actually, uh, yeah, we're actually okay on, on, on time. I actually think we might be even have a little bit of a short post game tonight, but, um, but I have been trying, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to wait longer intervals just because uh there's so much crazy here that if we did stop every time it was tempting to then we really would have to uh bring victor back for part three next week but uh but yeah a lot uh lot going on in this last 10 minutes yeah i thought it was um <laughs> there's a lot of fascinating claims made i mean the the most recent thing that i thought was funny was like you know, uh, this might just be like this sort of like pedantic, like analytic philosophy brain rot, but this claim that <laughs> like, you know, like it's bad in principle to inject people with new technology. It's like, I think we could imagine many hypothetical cases where this is not true. And like, you know, like presumably what matters in terms of whether we inject people with some technology is you know how much we know about its efficacy and its right. effects not how recent it is and i you know you, you could probably say the latter is like a proxy for the former but those two things do come apart yeah totally um i mean it's not i mean yeah i don't even understand what it means to say that it's wrong in principle i mean it's i mean insofar as newness indicates uncertainty then all else being equal, maybe it's wrong. But like in principle, what, 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 what principle is this? It's like, yeah, I could see that it's like the newer it is, the more that weighs against it or whatever. But um, but yeah, this seems like a funny way of using the phrase in principle. Um, as you know, I mean, it seems like yeah. Question is how, like how good, how you know, how much uncertainty do you actually have? Um, and and yeah what's the cost benefit trade-off in terms of the thing that you're vaccinating people against and and the dangers of that i mean that's uh peterson is a certain and he's 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 being so weaselly about this um because i you know this much destiny was totally right about that he started out clearly implying that uh, the vaccine had led to like tons of deaths. And then once he got pushed back against it, he was like, I'm, I'm not implying anything. Right? So, well, you clearly are implying that, right? And then he got so angry that he forgot that he said he wasn't implying that and he just asserted it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like it clearly shows up in the excess death that the vaccine is super <laughs> dangerous. Yeah. 
So yeah, no, that was bizarre. Yeah. Um, but and I actually do think again, I obviously, especially in the last six months, uh, this is not my favorite guy, uh, that Peterson is, is debating. I've, I've, I've I think I've been pretty upfront about the fact that I've been like deeply disgusted by his, you know, commentary on Israel, Palestine, the last six months, especially, uh, but, uh, but, but I actually do think he's doing something useful here because this is um, like the times that, I mean, not that, you know, not that destiny is a leftist, right? He's like a liberal centrist, but like the times that I've seen Peterson debate people, either leftists or people he would think of as leftists. Um, it's like, okay, there's this Slavoj Zizek, obviously in 2019 and just like, what was it like last year, maybe or the year before, right? He did the thing with uh, Kyle Kalinske. Uh, and, you know, both of those, I think there was, there was some value to, but it's like, um, you know, Kalinske, you know, somebody I like, uh, and, you know, and, and I think he did challenge him on some points that were good in there. But it's like, obviously, he just didn't want to go that confrontational in it, right? Like he he had, um, I mean, he was treating it as at least as much like an interview as a uh, as as a debate. And, you know, and, and he uh, and and he just like there was just only so much he was like thought, you know, I, I think for whatever reason was prepared to raise the temperature in that. And, you know. Zizek, um, I think, did something really useful with with his debate with uh, with Peterson. But the useful thing was just kind of um, presenting a more appealing vision of like what the left was than like what a lot of you know Jordan Peterson fans might imagine, and with a side of just like obviously being smarter and 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 making Peterson kind of look ridiculous just by contrast. And, um, you know, can't name the postmodern neo-Marxists, all that stuff. Uh, and, and he was able to do both of those things without being like really very confrontational at all. And, and I, I still think that was a good strategy. I'm still glad that he did that, but, but there is something useful in, in what Destiny is doing here, because I think we're really seeing that like in a context where somebody's there's actually going to be like push and pull about like specific claims and um and you know and the other person isn't like worried about trying to be respectful or whatever um i I think it's really showing that like peterson just cannot hack that like at all like how angry he's getting how hard a time he's having um you know again keep you know sticking with the thread of what they're talking about so like that i like a lot uh, and I also, I, and the other thing that, that I think is worth mentioning here, just cause like they spent so much time talking about it is all this stuff about the, um, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, I saw David Drake in the, in the chat, you know, had a good line about how, uh, it's like, Oh, you think, you think food you know, is, uh, is good. All right. I guess you love the food corporations. Uh, right. Right. Like, yeah, no, yeah, that's that's exactly it. It's like uh, this repeated insistence that, you know, like, oh, I would have expected the left to be skeptical of the efficacy of the vaccines. It's like, why? <laughs> like, based on what? Why? Like, the, the leftist critique of medical companies is that they operate for profit and they have an internally authoritarian structure, etc. You know, all the traditional, you know, sure. critiques of, of how companies function and what they are under capitalism. The, the, the critique has never been about, like, the efficacy of the product, you know, like, the, you know, they don't work in terms <laughs> of their intended effect. Like, one of the tragic things that the leftists are always lamenting if you actually listen to them talk is that you have this effective medical technology, but only some people have access to it and other people have to die because they don't have access to it because they don't have enough money. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the sort of, yeah, I mean, it's just a weird equivocation. Oh, I thought you didn't like the bloody pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. The thing that we don't like about them 
is that they're hoarded life saving uh, <laughs> technology, right? Like, uh, this is, you know, that like the whole premise of our not liking them is that the product works. That, you know, that right. like otherwise it wouldn't really matter. You could sell it for whatever and it, it, it wouldn't actually, like, people wouldn't die uh, because they couldn't <laughs> afford it, right? It certainly yeah. wouldn't matter in the same way. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the, the, I mean, you know, and again, if this is a place where it's a little bit frustrating um, that, um, and yeah, I'm not necessarily saying Kyle Kalinske should have taken this approach. I, I also think that since that one wasn't in person, <laughs> Peterson would have been a lot more likely to just storm off. You know? <laughs> so maybe he was doing the balance of like challenging him, but not being too aggressive that, you know, was, was going to get him to stay there and stay talking. But, um, but yeah, this is um, like, this is just a, this is just a total category mistake. I mean, it's like, yeah, you, it just has nothing to do with what the leftist critique of uh, pharma companies has ever been right. The whole thing is that it's like, yeah, we want, we want these everybody to have access to these medicines free at the point of service. Right. And we want people in, you know, third world countries to, you know, who can't, you know, who definitely wouldn't be able to afford, you know, this stuff to just like, you know, we, we, we don't like the intellectual property. We think everybody, you know, we, th we think everybody should be made available to everybody. And yeah, this is another place where maybe it's a little bit frustrating uh, that even though what, even though 99% of what Destiny is saying about this subject is good, it's also uh, one, uh, he, you know, he, he isn't making that critique because he doesn't, you know, because, because that's just not what he thinks, right? Or, or, you know, if he does, certainly not something, you know, that's central to him. And also, um, He's not um, like the way he put it at one point was like, oh, I think the pharmaceutical companies do a lot of good for a lot of people. Right. Whereas like, a, you know, somebody who had a more left position would just be like, well, I think that the government research that actually drives most pharmaceutical innovation does a lot of good for a lot of people. And then the pharmaceutical companies are these parasitical middlemen who establish, you know, who establish a monopoly on, uh, you know, life-saving intellectual property, you know, to like, re you know, reap profits from it, right? And that's the, you know, but it's like the solution is that we should nationalize the pharmaceutical companies and make their products available to everybody for free, right? Which is, again, the whole, you know, none of which, like, it's not like before COVID, the left critique of the pharmaceutical companies was that we didn't think the product worked. We always thought the products worked, right? The whole point was that we think the product should be available to everybody for free. Right. Ow. Well, the, look, if you're going to use Occam's razor, you're kind of stuck in an awkward place here. I'm absolutely not stuck in Occam's This is yes. the most administered vaccine in the hit or inoculation or whatever you want to call it, the history of all of mankind. Every single organization around the world is motivated to call this out if it was a bad thing. You don't think Russia or China would be screaming if Donald Trump or the United States warp sped through a vaccine that was having deleterious effects on populations all around the world? You don't think there wouldn't be some academic institution? You don't think there'd be more than a handful of doctors and Joe Rogan and some conservatives saying this vaccine might have been bad if it was the case that American companies working with companies in Europe and Germany especially Right, because that's where biotech is from, in order to create a uh, or manufacture a vaccine that was causing excess deaths all around the world. There are so many different people that we motivated to call this out. How do you explain that? No, it no, it's a handful of people. Where are the governments ah, calling it? Where are the academic a... institutions calling it? Where are the other private companies calling it out? Wouldn't you stand to make a killing if you were a private company in Europe and you could say, look, the mRNA vaccines for sure are causing all of these issues. Why wouldn't Putin? Why wouldn't Xi Jinping? Why wouldn't anybody else in the world call this out? It was as horrible as it was. There are plenty of people attempting to call Nobody out credible. The and no huge institution. What do you make of the excess deaths? You haven't come up with a bloody hypothesis. I don't even know if there are 20% at the excess deaths in Europe right now. If I had to guess off the top of my head, it's gonna be, like you said, one might be lingering effects of an overwhelmed healthcare system. Another one might be uh, deaths related to the war in Ukraine. Another one might be rising energy costs that have but happened for a couple of reasons. But it's absolutely impossible that any of it could be unintended consequences of a novel technology injected into billions of people. I think that if excess, first of all, there aren't billions of people in Europe. So if there were excess there deaths, were. I understand, but you're talking about excess deaths in Europe. I'm not aware of excess deaths that exist in other places that are completely and totally unaccounted for where the only explanation would be the vaccine. I think if well, there were, I think more people would be talking about it. Well, we have to, well, first of all, the number of people talking about something is not an indication of the scientific validity of a claim. 
I agree contract. with that, but for well, a vaccine, then why are was... you using mass consensus as a as the determinant of what constitutes because truth? Because I think for That's something never been the case. Because I think for something that was given to billions and billions of people, if this was something that was having a measurable effect on people, it would be it would be impossible to cover it up or ignore it. Well, we wouldn't you... have to look at the one case right. brought up on a on a documentary. We would have to look at the one thing being talked about. And what do you, you know, make but... of the VAERS data? The VAERS... There's more negative side effects reported from the mRNA vaccines than there were reported for every single vaccine ever created since the dawn of time, and not by a small margin. So it's not just the excess deaths, I agree. it's the VAERS data. What is VAERS data? It's the data base that until the COVID-19 pandemic emerged, and we had the unfortunate consequence that there were so many side effects being reported, it was the gold standard for determining whether or not vaccines were safe. And now as soon as it started to misbehave on the mRNA uh, vaccine front, we decided that we were going to doubt the validity of the VAERS reporting system. Okay, the VAERS reporting system never been the gold standard for anything. VAERS reporting is just if you want to report that there is some issue that you have after getting a vaccine. That's it. I think it's what vaccine mean, adverse. It? What the hell do you think it was set up for? To, to report adverse events Why? that happen after a vaccine. Why? To track and see if something was related to the vaccine. Right. right? So Why? most people, most people didn't even know VAERS existed until after the COVID vaccine. Once people know that it exists, of course, more people are, are going to engage with it. But what happens- So it's all noise. Report, no, it, well, it could be or couldn't be. So what do you do when a bunch of- Well, you being, first of all, might you so might begin by it, suggesting that maybe it's not all noise. Correct. So when Especially all of these the things are deaths. admitted to VAERS, what they do is from there, they investigate. All you can do, all of the, all VAERS is, is I might go and get a vaccine and maybe in three days ago, hmm, I got a headache. I'm going to go ahead and like call my doctor and, and make this report. And they'll say, okay, well, it's an adverse event after vaccine. It doesn't mean the vaccine caused the headache. And now that more people know about this system than ever. I'm, sure, saying I'm that just the saying that VAERS is not the gold standard of determining if a vaccine is working or not. Compared to what? Enough, compared to actual uh, longitudinal perspective, randomized control trial studies. You mean like the ones they should have done to the goddamn vaccine? Like the ones that they did do for the oh, vaccine, oh, and they continue yes. to do to this day. Yes, oh. that is correct. Yeah. They, yes, You really correct. think that you're in a position to evaluate the scientific credibility of the trials for the vaccines? Do you? Really? No, I don't. So I have to trust. Then what are you what doing? I, have to do, what I, have I don't to, trust. I have them. to I trust love the blood I have data. To, you have, first of all, you have to trust third parties to some extent. When you go outside, I don't have to trust. Of course you do. You do every day. When you turn the keys in your car, you hope your engine doesn't explode. When you're drinking water, you hope that the public water or whatever tap or bottle water you got it out of isn't contaminated or poisoned with cholera. I don't when do you that go, as a consequence of consensus. No, you, you. Of course you do. No, I don't. I do that as a consequence of observing multiple times that when I put the goddamn key in the ignition, the truck started. Why do you know it's going to start the 50th or the 100th time? Why do you, how many times do you wear those? with me. You I'm know not perfectly playing well Hume. Why. You don't know if the denim in those jeans isn't leaking into your bloodstream. To some extent, we trust, we have to trust third-party institutions Except to make determination. Except when they use force. Ex how about especially that? when they use force. We trust the police officers. We trust the we judicial do, systems. We do. We, do. We, we on the left trust the police. Do to we? some extent, do we? If somebody's breaking That's into your house, who do you call? Them. I'm not, I'm not a defunder, but if somebody's breaking into your house, you can be the most defund person in the world. Who are you going to call? Are you going to call your neighbor? Are you going to call Joe Biden? Are you going to call Obama? Are you going to call the Black Panthers? You're going to call the okay, cops. So, so tell me this. Tell me this then, because the core issue here is use of force as far as I'm concerned. You know, we, we examined some of the weeds around that. How is that the core issue? What does that have to do with it? throughout the world, and this would be true on the conservative side now, in the aftermath of the COVID um, tyranny, because it was more a tyranny than a pandemic, okay. were, are now saying that we actually didn't force anybody to take the vaccine. So what do you think of that claim? Like, so let's define force. I think it's because technically Canada, true, but I think it's silly. What do you mean it's technically true? Define force. Technically forced, true then. and that in the United States, at least, I think the idea, what they tried to do, they weren't able to do it because the Supreme Court shot it down, was Biden tried to make it so that OSHA, who's the body that regulates job safety, could make it so that employees had to get vaccinated. Now, eventually, that it was- Or what? Or they'd lose their job. Okay, does that qualify as force? That's why I said technically- Yeah, I know, but, no, not... but I'm at, it's a serious question. I mean, because we need to define what constitutes force be before we can- it seems to me- You could argue it's a type of force, sure. I mean, I think it'd be silly to say it's nothing. It, it is a type of force. It's the same as a cop telling you you have to do this, you're going to be killed. No, but it's it's right. on the spectrum. Sure, of course, yeah. It's as much force as the mRNA, mRNA vaccines are vaccines. Sure. It is a type of force, and the mRNA vaccines okay, are a okay, type of vaccine. So, so okay, okay, so okay. I look, I really, <laughs> think, I really think the problem was mm -hmm. with the COVID response, I really think the problem was the use of force. I mean, I can understand to some degree 
although I'm very skeptical of the pharmaceutical companies and far more skeptical than your insistence upon the utility of consensus might lead me to believe you're skeptical of them, which is surprising, I would say, given I'm that- I'm very skeptical of them. That's why I'm glad there's multiple companies, multiple countries, multiple academic institutions that do research, and the FDA. Yeah, I'm very skeptical. You should be in any private system. You should be skeptical of every private company, of course, whether we're talking media, pharmaceuticals, or automobile manufacturers, yeah. But skepticism doesn't mean a blind adherence to the complete total opposite of whatever it is they're saying, right? They're in doubt, undoubtedly, like if you look at how Alzheimer's research, there's been groundbreaking improvements on drugs to treat Alzheimer's research over the past three years that five years ago, none of these drugs even existed. And now, yeah, so I mean- How about if you're skeptical of anyone who's u- willing to use force to put their doctrine forward? Then, you, then you're skeptical of, of literally every single person, political ideology ever to ever have existed in, in all of humankind. Some degree of force, you would I'm undoubtedly believe this, right? Some degree of force is probably necessary for any kind of cohesive society, right? No, I don't believe that. Of course there is. No, even I if don't you had a tribe that. of 100, 120 people, if somebody was uh, if somebody was stealing something, right? You have to punish that person. I that said earlier that 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 becomes complicated when you're dealing with the psychopathic types, right? So that's a complication. But, but I would say, generally psycho- speaking, but, okay, that. The, the necessity to use force is a sign of bad policy. And no, I don't think, see, I'm not particularly a Hobbesian. I don't think that the only reason people comport themselves with a certain degree of civility in civilized society is because they're terrified by the fact that the government has a monopoly on force that can be brought against them at any moment. I think that keeps the psychopaths in line to some degree. But I think that most people are enticed into a cooperative relationship and that formulating the structures that make those relationships possible is a sign of good policy. I've got to, I have to ask, because I have watched a lot of your stuff in the past. Um, I remember you speaking very distinctly on this, that for instance, when two men are communicating with each other, there is an underlying threat of force that kind of puts on the guardrails those particular social interactions. For instance, yeah, I the could threat of force around, is yeah. don't be psychopathic. What is it? How broader is psychopathic here? Are we defining? Well, I can define it. I mean, sure. Yeah, go for it. Well, a psychopath will gain short-term advantage at the cost of long-term relationship. Okay, that's okay. really the core issue. Well, you know, you you made a you made a reference to something like that earlier mm-hmm. in your discussion, when you pointed out that people claim to be motivated, let's say, by principle, but will default to short-term gratification more or less at the for drop of a hat. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Well, the the exaggerated proclivity to do that is at the essence of psychopathy. So it's a very, it's think, very I'm immature. I'm curious, with, that, with this definition of psychopathy, does it's that mean It's the I... definition of psychopathy. It's not an ad, it's not mine. That's the core of psychopathy. Okay, I'm not, I, in, the, in the United States, I think we call it all ASPD now. Um, no, it's, the... it's separate from, that's antisocial personality disorder. They're I thought separate. that subsumed psychopathy and sociopathy. Psychopathy is... No, psychopathy is more like some, it's more the pathological core of antisocial personality disorder. Okay, maybe that might be true, okay. That's a better way of thinking. Like the worst, a small number of criminals are responsible for the vast majority of crimes. It's 1% Mm -hmm. commit 65%, something like that. Do you think, is psychopathy something that can be environmentally induced? Or do you think this is core to a person? It's both. So for example, if you're disagreeable, Mm -hmm. like you are, by the way, one of the your proclivity, if you went wrong, would be to go wrong in an antisocial and psychopathic direction. Mm-hmm. That's more true of men, for example, than it is for women. That's why men are more likely to be in prison by a lot. Mm-hmm. I think it's 10 to 1, or 20 to 1 generally, it depends on the particular crime, with it being higher proportion of men as the violence of the crime mounts. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine on the genetic versus environment side. So imagine that when you're delivered your temperamental hand of cards, you're going to have a certain set of advantages that go along with them that are part and parcel of the, that genetic determination. And there's going to be a certain set of temptations as well. So for example, if you're high in trait neuroticism, you're gonna be quite sensitive to the suffering of others and be able to detect that. That's useful for infant care, uh-huh. but the cost you'll pay is that you'll be more likely to develop depression and anxiety. And if you're disagreeable, if you're disagreeable, extroverted and unconscientious, then you're, the tilt, the place you'll go if you go badly is in the psychopathic or antisocial direction. And All right. I was hoping to find a more natural place to stop than this, but I don't think there's going to be one. At least anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, yeah. Cause they got off into a really weird thing here. Cause 
it, as hard as it is to remember, um, all of this started because they were arguing about whether the vaccines were effective and or whether they, you know, had some crazy secret side effects that, you know, haven't, you know, haven't shown up in the medical literature and, you know, et cetera. That was the original subject. And then Peterson said, well, the core issue here is the use of force. It's like, well, no, it's not. That's a, you know, certainly, that's certainly not the core issue and whether it's effective or not. Right. I mean, this is, um, seat belts are enforced with a lot more coercion than COVID vaccines ever were. Right. But that by itself doesn't tell us that seat belts don't work. Right. You know, so like these, these are just different issues, but, uh, destiny just went with him. He didn't challenge him on that point. So he's, you know, he's like, you know, the core issue is the use of force. So, you know, what would, you know, what counts as force? And then they're, uh, and then destiny did make, you know, a reasonable point, which is, well, hold on though. I mean, surely all societies, right. All social institutions are backed up with some kind of threat of force. There's no such thing as a coercion free society. And then Peterson didn't concede that because Peterson is got him to a place here where he doesn't concede anything. And, um, and destiny again, calling balls and strikes here said another reasonable thing, which is that he, illustrated this by saying, well, hold on, even if you have like a tribe of 100, 150 people, right? You know, if, if uh, somebody's like stealing, right, something that they're not supposed to have according to the, the rules of the tribe, aren't you going to use force to stop it? And rather than saying, oh, I guess you're right, so I'm going to reconsider my claim, Peterson said something that was just kind of a weird non sequitur, which is, well... Essentially, I mean, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said, uh, well, yeah, I guess you need a little force, but just for the psychopaths. Um, yeah. And then everything since then has been about what psycho- psychopathy is. But it's like, why are we talking about what counts as psychopathy? Like, you think the only people who steal are psychopaths? Yeah. And And whether that was true or not, it has nothing to do with like, I mean, even if they were the only people who steal, I mean, you're going to have some percentage of those people, surely, right? So you are still going to need, you know, coercion to enforce any possible system for the use of scarce resources, uh, which I I think is like the core of the good point that Destiny was actually making about that. So, um, so yeah, and then I I just decided to stop here because we've been going for a long time and I don't. I'm not, I'm no longer confident that they're going to circle back to the original subject. Yeah. Yeah. No, there has been a lot of, um, yeah. I mean, they've, they've went through a bunch of different things at this point. Uh, there's, there's a lot of strange comments. Like, um, I liked that exchange where, um, you know, des- they were talking about the efficacy of the vaccine and Peterson brings up excess deaths as evidence that like the vaccine is, uh, is like killing people and that it shouldn't have been given to people. And then, you know, like, uh, destiny says he rejects that. And so Peterson is like, okay, well, what are the excess deaths caused by then? And destiny gives like examples of things that could plausibly be causing it. Like, you know, deaths of despair related to the lockdowns or whatever, you know, the fact that there was a virus, um, you know, like lots of different facts, the strain on the healthcare system, et cetera. And then he he didn't even, he didn't even mention, like lingering after effects of COVID, which is like a yeah, pretty yeah. obvious one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then um, you know, Peterson's reply was, Oh, but it's impossible that it's the vaccine. <laughs> and it's like, well, no, but the point is we have reason to expect lots of excess deaths, regardless of whether or not we think the vaccine is effective or dangerous. So the uptick in excess deaths isn't really evidence that the vaccine is dangerous. Like if it's an observation that we would have expected regardless, it's not an observation that like raises the probability of your particular hypothesis. Um, Yeah. Uh, That's a really good point. Um, But yeah, it it was also like, just, it's just, it's so silly, right? When he, he makes the, again, he's very good at sounding confident and angry and like, you know, it's just like, 
projecting that what he thinks is so bloody obvious that he can't believe that you're disagreeing with him about it. Yeah. But like, what what is he actually saying, right? When he did that, it's like, well, you were clearly insinuating that this is the cause. And now you're going to be like, oh, so you can absolutely rule out that it's the cause? Like, well, I didn't <laughs> say that. I said I that I'm not convinced that it is the cause. Like, this is, it's like, I don't know, like, absolutely rule it out. I think it's very unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like uh, I don't believe. Be a good reason. <laughs> It's like, I don't believe your hypothesis. Oh, so you're saying my hypothesis is impossible. <laughs> There's like right. a logical contradiction to be derived from my hypothesis. It's like, well, no. <laughs> Clearly <laughs> not saying not that. evidence <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, it's, I thought the uh, the section about the, um, the uh, you know, it seemed like Destiny was... They were doing this like exchange about because Destiny was like, oh, well, I trust the medical institutions. And Peterson's like, I don't. And Destiny's like, well, of course you do. You trust, you know, this oh, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's like, oh, well, I believe that on the basis of induction. And it's <laughs> like for some of these examples, sure. But like, you know, the, the point that Destiny is making is that there are just lots of things that you wouldn't believe if you didn't form beliefs on the basis of like higher order evidence and expert testimony, etc. Right. And not all of them can be covered by your own experience. Like if I asked Jordan Peterson why he believes like the germ theory of disease or like, you know, the earth not being flat, you know, he couldn't really... Um, I'm sure he couldn't, he doesn't have some inductive evidence that, you know, or experience to point to. He would point to, you know, scientific consensus, et cetera. Um, it's not like any of these theories could be proved in any sort of trivial way just by appealing to the average person's experience in any case. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, this is, I mean, I always, when I'm talking about this in classes, like, like in person classes, I always, ask people to raise their hand if they believe in Einstein's special theory of relativity and then see if anybody could take me through the evidence right. uh, you know, that uh, convinces physicists that it's true. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's just obviously true. And yeah, I also think that like um, maybe Destiny's wording opened himself up to this a little bit, but I really don't think the core of what he was saying was some kind of human anti-induction thing, right? Like that's, which is how Peterson yeah. was interpreted it. Yeah. Like, you know, if, if there's something, you know, cause he said the thing about your car blowing up. So I guess I could understand that they all, although even there, right. I mean, it's like you have, you know, when you talk about like uh, when cars actually are recalled cause they have some safety defect that like sometimes makes like the brakes not stop working or something like that. It's like, well, the last 50 times you took the car out, right? Yeah. It didn't have that and then it did. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, was Peterson like the, was he extremely skeptical the first time he ever put his key in the ignition? You know, right. like, I, I don't know if this is going to work, but you know, after it did. You know, figure you take your life into your hands the first time, you know, every time you're, you know, yeah. you're a little bit, okay, okay. I probably won't <laughs> die. Right. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. It's clearly the higher order evidence is, um, uh, you know, I mean, that that kind of, you know, indirect evidence from, you know, from consensus and institutions uh, is clearly playing a huge role there. Uh, and yeah, a lot of other, and like, even I think when he said that don't bloody play Hume with me, right? Like, well, I, I think the last thing Destiny had said before that was um, that he didn't think it was that uh was about the there could be like chemicals leaching you know leaching into your legs from your blue jeans right and it's like right. Well, well well surely peterson's not believing that doesn't have anything to do with induction right i mean if if there's something that's like slowly building up in his bloodstream mm -hmm. right i mean that it, it's that's not induction i mean this isn't you know i mean you might as well say like you know i i uh you know i've i've, I've smoked 100 cigarettes and you know and i've i've, I've never once <laughs> You know, I've never once, you know, gotten a lung cancer diagnosis, you know, so <laughs> right, right. I'm confident that my continuing to smoke won't lead to that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like, um, like if Peterson's view is, um, okay. Cause so he makes this comment like, oh, you know, do you think you have the background to parse the science? 
Ugh. And then he also says that he disbelieves like medical consensus. He doesn't trust it. So it's right. like, why do you have any view on this? <laughs> like, should you not just be like radically skeptical about all things medical in this case? Like, I, I just don't like where, like, what are you basing your view on? If it's not you parsing through the evidence for yourself or you appealing to, you know, some testimony or consensus or something. Yeah, clearly. Right. Like, uh, cause he's, yeah, that's also a very good point. Like he, um, that, uh, well, destiny, you know, doesn't have the expertise to figure it out, but also like the ex, like also the overwhelming consensus of the experts can't be trusted. Right. right? The, the thing that can be trusted is like right there in the gray area <laughs> where you have somebody who's like, uh, who has some training as a clinical psychologist and just like yeah. going through, you know, what they can figure out and gloss from the epidemiological data on their own. Right. Like that's, that's really the, the golden zone where, uh, you know, where you can definitely trust the results. Right. Uh, I also got uh, somebody sent me a message on, on Patreon said uh, from Eurostats website in January, 2024 excess mortality, in the EU, decreased significantly to 3.6% above the baseline compared with 9.5% in December, 2023, January, 2024, access mortality continued to vary across the EU, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Lithuania, Croatia, Luxembourg, Slovakia, Poland, Latvia, and uh, Czechia recorded no excess deaths in January, 2024. The highest excess mortality rates were the Netherlands, 15.3 Denmark, 11.5 and Germany, 9.9. So, um, I'm just, you know, reading off the message I was I was sent. I will not claim to have done my own research on this, uh, but um, but yeah, it is particularly insane to introduce a factual claim in the conversation that the other person has previously never heard of, and that by your own admission, it's not like shocking that they've never heard of it it's it's not like oh you know oh my god how have you never heard of that right it's it's something that according to your own view of the world is like uh for malicious reasons uh scientific and medical institutions like aren't broadcasting this the way they should be right so you're asserting something to be the case that by your own accounting it's to be expected that people haven't heard before you're asserting it and then you're like, well, how do you bloody well account for that? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I don't even know if it's true. I mean, right. maybe it's like half true and you're, and you're also like a weird hysteric. So you're probably misinterpreting it at least a little bit, you know, like, right, right. You know, I, I'd like to look into it, you know, before I just take it as a given. I mean, which, you know, in fact, destiny is sort of gamely accepted it as a premise for a lot right. of this. It's like, yes, I, sure, let's run with that, right? The 20, you know, 20% thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, it's such a weird tactic, you know, to do. Like, this is, you know, here's a thing you've never heard. I don't expect you to have heard. Take my word for it and then, <laughs> yeah. like, immediately account for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's sort of, yeah, it's a strange move. It's like, yeah, I mean, and I guess like uh, well, one thing that we kind of hinted at or kind of, well, yeah. we, one thing that we mentioned earlier was like, you know, there's this point because uh, it seemed like, you know, with the thing we were just discussing about, um, you know, like what's what exactly is Jordan Peterson's basis for accepting a lot of things, if not expert testimony. And it's weird because he seems to be shifting like back and forth a lot between like different claims. It's so, like at one point it seemed like he was saying, Oh, you know, I only trust things based on my own induction or whatever. I don't yeah. trust things on the basis of consensus. It seems like at another point he was saying, okay, maybe I'm willing to accept things uh, as a matter of consensus, except for when they start being like coercively enforced, which is like, again, it's just like, wh like why? <laughs> like, I don't see the basis for that inference at all like using force uh like you said might be ethically objectionable sure. but i don't see why it like tells against the efficacy of what's being enforced especially when uh the institutions that are creating these things and testing them and forming the uh 
you know, the the medical institutions that are forming the consensus around these things uh, is to some degree separated from the government, the agent that's enforcing these things. I mean, obviously, there's there's some level of intermingling, sure. but um, yeah, it's I, I just don't get I don't get where that claim is coming from. Yeah, again, I I would love to, I would love it if Destiny asked here. It's like, well, do you think seatbelts work? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If not, what's the dis- distinction? Because in fact, again, much more coercion is used to get people to wear seatbelts than to get people to get the shot. Like the the worst thing that, like, even if you lived in Manhattan, um, yeah, depending on your employer, maybe, right? you could be required to uh, to get vaccinated as a condition of your employment. Although even if you lived in Manhattan, I'm sure lots of employers still didn't. Right. But like maybe that. Um, and yeah, for like, there were like a couple months in 2021 where theoretically, I mean, I know from experience it was not enforced very much, but theoretically, you know, indoor dining would be a problem. And it's like, yeah, th- those are, uh, those are mechanisms of coercion, no doubt about it, right? But like nobody was ever given a ticket for like not having the vaccine in their bloodstream, right? Like this is, right. uh, you know, uh, like you could, you know, yeah, you could go to jail for, you know, for not paying your tickets for uh, for for not wearing a seatbelt, you know, there's like, or like, does, does Jordan Peterson believe that alcohol impairs the ability to drive safely? <laughs> Cause like yeah. we enforce that one even more, right? <laughs> like, right, right, right. <laughs> like it's yeah. just it's it's just such a weird non sequitur to to even like conflate the you know whatever you think about the ethics of coercion in any of these cases to like conflate that with the epistemic issue about whether you know whether the vaccines uh, vaccines actually work. You know, I mean, it's just it just the one has absolutely nothing to do with the other. Um, I saw, uh, hold on, let me find the comment. Uh, yeah, so Dorb Pryor says this is why sources should be exchanged before a debate. It's like, yeah, I, I mean, I think that what I what I always think is just that like the sort of least fruitful thing you can do in a debate is argue about whether an empirical premise is true or not. I'm not saying that's something you can necessarily totally avoid, but like, I, I just think that to the extent that you're focused on it, that's probably going to be less interesting and fruitful for like a, you know, a live, you know, verbal kind of debate. Um, Cause it's so hard to check on the fly. Right. I mean, like, like so much, so often, and yeah, you could exchange sources although things could also organically come up, you know, that you, you weren't necessarily planning to talk about and, you know, and, and it's so, you know, so often it's like, what are you going to do? Like, well, I don't think that's true, but I'll look into it and get back to you. Right. Like, um, you know, this is why I think that like, even on, um, you know, I don't know, like the Israel Palestine one I did with Brianna Wu, uh, I, you know, what I tried to do with that, uh, and, and, you know, what I, um, you know, fact, Nathan Robinson before he debated destiny, what I kind of advised him to try to do, you know, is, is just like, like, don't get bogged down in the sort of like nitty gritty of empirical premises to the extent that you could avoid it. Right. Cause it's like in like the Palestine case, it doesn't really matter. Like it's not that it doesn't matter, but it's like the most important issue is not exactly what happened at Camp David or Taba or with the Peel Commission in 1937 or, you know, whatever. I mean, it's like all of these are interesting things to talk about, right? But like n- nothing could be true about those subjects that would make it the case that it's like okay to ethnically cleanse people or deny ethnic cleansing victims the right to come back or rule over, you know, millions of people in the West Bank and Gaza for 57 years without giving them rights in your state. Right. I mean, like that. Right. So, so I think the, the more, I, I think it tends to be more productive for like live verbal debates to just o- avoid as much as at all possible, getting bogged down in the nitty gritty of issues like that. And to the greatest extent possible, focus on like principles and inferences be like, okay, look, let's say 
the Arab High Commission in Jerusalem totally should have gone for the the appeal, you know, proposal. They did. Okay, what would follow from that? Right? What do you think? Right. What do you think that would justify, and why would it justify it? Right? I mean, like that's that's just a much more productive uh, debate to have. Have and you know, similarly, in you know, in this case, I think that like, you know, what exactly, um, you know, what exactly the the rate of excess death is in which European country win? I mean, it's just something that's like, yeah, you have a very hard time. Like the debaters themselves, whoever is not making the claim, has a very hard time judging it on the fly people who are watching it have a very hard time judging judging it. I mean, they can look it up later maybe if they remember, but like they have a very hard time judging it on the fly. Uh, whereas, you know, if, yeah, I mean, I think something like, do we actually think higher order evidence is a thing that matters? Is that something that could be in insa- kid that can be like sanely rejected, right? What, right. Is, what, what possible structure of beliefs would that leave you with? If you rejected it, right? Like that's the kind of thing I think you actually can have a productive debate about. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I think like a good heuristic is, is just like, you know, if, if you're making some point in a debate, if you're thinking about like, okay, how productive is this line of argument going to be? It's like, okay, like, does my opponent being able to engage with this, like, is that contingent on them having, you know, previously read some, right. you know, like <laughs> complex factual account or analysis or something? Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's generally better to, to try and avoid that kind of stuff. Um, I also think it's sort of, um, you know, on the question of, uh, um, you know, like how Jordan Peterson justifies his uh you know his belief in the efficacy of seat belts i was wondering if he's done his like you know maybe he's done his like novel psychological analysis where he like dry you know gets in a bunch of car crashes without seat belts and then gets in a bunch of car crashes with seat belts and see you know where when he turns out better (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's like the old uh yeah the old joke about you know um you know i'm only gonna take evidence-based parachutes seriously <laughs> yeah yeah his <laughs> wife is like jordan you can't do this again you're you're severely injured he's like no one's done the damn analysis properly yet <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> and yeah and, and it's just like and look i mean i think a lot i think the reason yeah i mean i think a big pro like i think it is often a problem something i'm you know obviously you know, it's destiny and Jordan Peterson. So there's like a certain alien versus predator aspect of the whole thing. But like, um, oftentimes when I'm watching debates where, where one person, like I, I just very clearly and unambiguously agree with one thing that I, I'm often very frustrated by is that a lot of people think that it's like, it shows weakness to ever concede anything. And it's really important that anytime somebody says something wrong, you have to push back. And so, what that leads them to do is to get diverted into the weirdest rabbit holes that have absolutely nothing to do with the main thing yeah. that they want a viewer to get yeah. out of it. So like in this case, it's like, I don't, I don't know why, like, I mean, I, why are they, are they talking about the definition of a, of a psychopath? Like, like, as, like it, <laughs> yeah. it just what hinges on this that like matters for any larger subject they're debated. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's definitely like a virtue to being like, you know, in any context when you're debating, like you need to frequently step back and be like, okay, what is like the core? Like, what is the actual proposition here? Like, what's like the broad point that we're talking about? And do I need to argue some particular uh, stance on this, you know, you know, this small detail in order to justify my broader position uh, on the thing being debated. And if the answer is no, then just point that out and keep going, you know? Yeah, right. Just be like, okay, I'm not sure that you're right about that, but whatever, you know, like, right. like let it, you know, slide right now because what I really want to go back to, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, granted, Jordan Peterson in the mood that he's in here uh, might be the interlocutor would be hardest to do that with because he would because he'd like probably start yelling at you you know it's like no damn it why don't you think that <laughs> yeah. well details are important 
exactly. All right, let's watch maybe just a couple more minutes and then go to the post game. And there are environmental determinants of that to some degree. Sure, genes express themselves in an environment. I, I agree. Um, when I'm just curious for the definition of psychopathy for short term gain at the expense of long term relationship, relationship, really, that's probably the best bit. Yeah, when yeah. you look at stuff like people that are self destructive, say people that engage in behavior, at least like obesity, is that like a type of psychopathy to you, or is that like something different? Or how do you define these types of things, I guess? Or how do you view that type of thing? Well, the, 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 no, no, there is an overlap in that addictive processes, one of which might lead to obesity, uh -huh. do have this problem of prioritization of the short term. But the distinct, so that overlaps with the short term orientation of the psychopath, but a psychopath is, see an obese person isn't gaining anything from your demise at to facilitate their obesity, uh -huh. right? So there's a predatory and parasitical element to psychopathy that's not there in other addictive short-term processes. Do you think, is it possible that there are things, because uh, then to circle back to the, the tribal example I gave, isn't it possible that people can commit harms against other people where they're not necessarily gaining from their demise, but it's just some other sort of gain that well, they're doing better? So for yeah, instance, like well, say yes. like I'm talking to some friends and I'm just gossiping or shit talking another person. I'm not necessarily feeling good that I'm trashing them per se. I'm feeling good because this group of friends might be more favorably because I have like a gossip or something to share with them. Well, but the, but that's the gain right there. Mm -hmm. Is and you are contributing to the demise of the people you are you're gossiping sure. about. But the, but I think there's like I feel like there's fundamentally different type of thought process between like I want to tell you something juicy about this guy because it'll make you like me versus I want to tell you something juicy about this guy because I hate this guy and I want him to like have a worse reputation among people. I feel like there's different drivers for that. I would say that's a, that's an interesting distinction. I would say probably probably that the hatred induced. Malevolence it's is a worse the... form of malevolence than the popularity inducing malevolence. Yeah, the, the know, only it's, reason it's I, a tough one, but yeah, the only reason I bring that up is because I feel like a lot of malevolence that we have social guardrails for is that type of like selfish malevolence where you're not. I would argue even the majority of malevolence in the world is usually people acting selfishly or being inconsiderate, not necessarily like I hate this. Yeah, person. I, I think that's right. Sure. I think okay. that well, that's why Dante outlined levels of hell. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, exactly that. And I mean, that 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 book was an investigation into the structure of malevolence, right? Mm -hmm. He put betrayal at the bottom, mm -hmm. which I think is right. I think that's right, because people who develop post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, which almost only accompanies an encounter with malevolence rather than tragic circumstances, they are often betrayed, mm -hmm. sometimes by other people, but often by themselves. And yes, there are levels of hell, you know, and you outlined a couple there. So I guess then my question is just that if you have people, so the kid that steals an orange from a stand, not because he hates the shop owner, but because he wants the orange or he's hungry, without some type of societal, it doesn't have to be the government, it could be family, religious, without some type of use of force, do you think that society ever exists without Use force on your wife? Um, well, what are we considering force? Is withholding sex, for instance, is that considered force? Or is, uh, you know, saying we're going to well, cancel a vacation? Deprivation of an expected reward is a punishment. So um, so you sure. could, well, no, but, but I mean, this is a serious question. I mean, yeah. look, look, if we're, we're thinking about the optimization of social structures, mm -hmm. we might as well start from the base level of social structure and scaffold up. Sure. So right? I, I, I like if a wife is upset at a husband, for instance, would that be considered... Uh, use of force. I think a negative punishment. You're removing a stimulus to punish a person mm -hmm. for something. Yeah. Would you consider that like a use of force? Or I would say it would depend to some degree on the intent. The intent is to punish. Behavior, well, if the right? intent is to punish, then then it's starting to move into the into the domain of force. I mean, look, mm -hmm. look. While we've been talking, you know, there have been bursts of emotion, right? Yeah. And that's because we're freeing entropy and trying to close and to enclose it again. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to produce. It produces negative emotion, fundamentally, most fundamentally, anxiety and pain, and secondarily, something like anger, because those emotions are quite tightly linked. Sure. And so within the confines of a marriage, because we might as well make it concrete, there are going to be times when disagreements result in bursts of emotion. Mm -hmm. And those bursts of emotion don't necessarily have to have an instrumental quality, right? It's when the emotion is used manipulatively to gain an advantage that's short-term for the person and then maybe that's at the expense of the other person or even at the expense of the person who benefits future self, then it starts to tilt into the manipulative. There's a, there's a tetrad of, of, of traits. Mm -hmm. So narcissism, 
Machiavellianism, that's manipulativeness. Nar narcissism is the desire for unearned social status. That's what you'd gain, for example, if you were gossiping and elevating yeah. your social status. Machiavellianism, narcissism, psychopathy, that's predatory parasitism, and those culminate in sadism and that cloud of negative emotion that's released in the aftermath of disagreement can be tilted in the direction of those traits. And that's when it becomes malevolent. And that's when the problem of force starts to become paramount. Because I, I think I think that your I think that your fundamental presupposition was both Hobbesian and ill-formed. I do not believe that the basis for the civilized polity is force. Now you're saying that you know you can't abjure the use of force entirely. And I would say unfortunately that's true. I would agree with you. But if the if the policy isn't invitational. If I can't make a case that that's powerful enough for you to go there voluntarily, then the policy is flawed. Now, it may be that we have some cases where we can't do better than a flawed policy because we're not smart enough. And mm -hmm. maybe the incarceration of, mo of criminals with a long-term history of violent offenses is a good example of that. We don't know how to invite those people to play. Mm -hmm. they, they have a history, generally from the time they're very young children, from the age of two, of not being able to play well with others. And it's a very, very intractable problem. There's no evidence in the social science literature at all that hyper-aggressive boys by the age of four can ever be socialized in the course of their life. All right. Uh, Ethan, are you a hyper-aggressive boy? That's right. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, bad news, bad news for you then. Um, okay, <laughs> this is, yeah, it is really so. Uh, so yeah, we'll 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 leave it here and and go you know go to the post game in a minute. Uh, we've we've only got about uh, oh yeah, just about eighteen minutes on the dot left to the original video. I usually figure watching and talking about it takes about twice as long as the video itself. So. Um, so probably, you know, probably like a little bit of a shorter post game, like 36, 40 minutes. But, um, but yeah, this is, um, this is really weird. <laughs> like this whole part of the conversation about, uh, is, you know, is, uh, not banging your wife because you're mad at her uh, kind of force and, you know, Maybe it's maybe it's a little bit of force, and uh, at the end, Jordan is wandering off into like he's again. He's so angry about so many things that really makes him have a, a hard time pay, like staying on topic and like following the thread of his argument because he was just going through this whole like libertarian sort of pseudo anti coercion argument, but then he got to like you know crime on the street law and order stuff and like yeah. it's like the, the, the new the other program asserted itself and it's like oh no wait a second like i have a whole thing about this and i'm just not even going to think about how it fits into what i've been saying yeah no there were so many times throughout this section in particular where i was just like like what where even are we right now like what I, like i don't understand like what we're even doing on this point <laughs> you know it's like yeah, it's, it's hard to see how most of the stuff they're debating about at this point, like sort of links back to any of the major points of contention. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, and, and and this like looseness about coercion is also really interesting to me. Like it, mm -hmm. it, I mean, going back to the earlier conversation, Peterson is so offended by the coercion to get people to get the COVID vaccine. But, you know, yeah, other than some indoor dining restrictions in some cities, right, mm -hmm. uh, at, at some points, um, certainly didn't affect most of the country. Like all the coercion, you know, maybe some travel restriction, although – Again, it seems like he wants this to apply to the anyway, they have it like the US and you know, there's certainly never a point where Americans were, you know, pro prohibited from traveling anywhere, right? Because they weren't vaccinated, you know, like that's never happened. Um, 
you know, well, for the, it hasn't happened for the COVID vaccine, at least there are actually other, you know, there are other vaccine related uh, travel restrictions, but um, like 95% of what he's talking about when he's talking about coercion is employment based. And it's like, well, hold on, hold on. If your livelihood right? That, you know, you, you can only have a job and thus support yourself. If you agree to do X counts as coercion to do X, then I have a really hard time seeing how that's going to fit with Jordan's view about capitalism. Right. Yeah. I, I was wondering if he, if he thinks that, you know, public employers saying you have to get a vaccine to work here is more coercive than private employers saying the same thing and like you know or you know private employers saying any of the things that they typically will say you know like basically conditioning employment on any factor like oh you can't work here if you have a tattoo or you can't work here if you do this or that um uh like is is this coercion on his view because if this is all coercion on his view then you start to, you know, you start to see this like pretty robust case being built for things like, you know, regulations of public companies or, you know, things like that, which presumably he would want to say is where regulation begins and ends um, in, in other contexts. Yeah. I mean, look, it is wage labor a form of free labor or not, right? Like if, if he wants to say that, you know, that the subordination of wage laborers to their employers uh, is is free. It's not coercive. Uh, you know, then I don't I don't see how this fits with like this level of being offended at the coercion of saying you have to do X or you won't have a job. Right. I mean, like, why, like, why doesn't that apply to the coercion of uh, capitalist employment contracts that if you you know, if you don't agree that you're boss keeps to keep, you know, uh, to, you know, a certain percentage of what you produce is profits and they get to tell you what to do at work. And, you know, like you said, tattoos, whole thing, right? Like, um, it, it just, you know, it, it I, I really don't understand how those views are, uh, are supposed to uh, fit together. But as somebody suggested in the chat much earlier in the stream today, uh, perhaps instead of asking destiny to uh, ventriloquize, the radical left for him. He could actually seek out some representatives of the radical left and have a fascinating conversation about some of these issues. But on that note, we are going to go to the post game for patrons. Uh, if you are a patron, you should have gotten the email a little over an hour ago. Uh, if you're not, there's no time like the pair present patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. And we are going to be over there to uh, watch uh, the last chunk of this in just a minute left is best. Mm -hmm. 